Thank you for joining us today. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar, the California Consumer Privacy Act, Applicability to the UK, EU, and Beyond. At this time, I'd like to introduce our presenter. Joining us is Scott Giordano, VP of Data Protection at Spirion. Scott's a highly regarded data privacy attorney with over 20 years of experience. Welcome, Scott. Thanks for having me on, Doug. Good afternoon, everyone that is listening in the UK and the EU. Very happy to have you on the webcast today. And I do want to encourage you to ask questions, send them in. We, uh, we answer questions as we get them and be happy to address them. So what are we going to do this hour? Uh, we're going to talk about the uh, Consumer, California Consumer Privacy Act, what's happened since its enactment, which was, has a story in and of itself, but uh, I won't belabor it. And we'll talk about who's protected, who's subject, because it is indeed applicable outside of the U.S. We'll talk about some of the principal requirements, and I'll compare and contrast them to GDPR. And uh, we'll talk about some ideas on how to comply, and I'll offer some closing thoughts. So without further ado, let's talk about CCPA and what's happened since it was enacted this year. And if you go to, there we go, thanks, Doug. So, oh, by the way, before we, we dig into it, I do want to uh, say that if you leave with nothing else, I ask you to leave with these three things. One is that while the GDPR is longer in terms of text, CCPA is much more complex, and that's owing to how quickly it was developed, depending on who you speak with, between over two or six days. So somewhere in that neighborhood. So uh, as opposed to GDPR, which was, I think, four years, perhaps five years, we had a much shorter runway on developing that. Secondly, it has global applicability. I'll talk about that in depth. In terms of the idea of preventing the sale of data, this is something that doesn't have an easy equivalent under GDPR. And in fact, it's going to make life very difficult for uh, those companies that are selling personal data because in many cases, their business model is based on it. And then finally, the creation or your update, if your data inventory is still going to be crucial, I suspect all of you already have a data inventory, but updating it to include those uh, references to third parties to whom you're licensing it and the ability to opt out, et cetera, that's going to be crucial for complying with both regulations. So those are the three things I'd like you all to leave with. And so with that, now we'll dig into the guts of CCPA. So um, in summary, CCPA is somewhat GDPR-like. You'll hear people say, oh, this is the U.S. version of GDPR. I think that has a lot of validity. Some people vehemently disagree with that, but I think it has a lot of validity. It's effective January 1, 2020, so a little over 12 months, basically 12 months from now. But there's 12-month look back that we'll talk about. That is to say that I'll go into some depth later, but for the, the net net of it is that you have to start preparing your data inventory or your updates January 1st, 2019, not 2020. This applies to consumers, which in our parlance is California residents, and that's in distinction to GDPR, which applies to basically anyone inside the four walls of the EU. So this includes your employees. So if you are an employer, perhaps you're headquartered in the UK or somewhere else in the EU, and you have operations in California, then it applies to your employees as well. Some of the rights, some of these rights you're gonna be very familiar with, because again, they're, they were started with GDPR. So right to be informed about personal data that's uh, being collected about you. There's a right to prevent information being sold to third parties, hence why that's in red. I wanted to emphasize that. Right to data portability. We're all familiar with that with GDPR. This act applies to all businesses that collect or use personal information, not just those in California, and I'll show you why that's the case in a bit. And the California AG can bring civil penalties of up to $7,500 per violation, one record being lost or stolen or what have you or, or misused, that's considered a violation. So you can see that this can get very spendy very quickly. If you even had a thousand records in scope, potentially it could be a big problem. Also, there's a limited private right of action, as we call it here in the U.S., meaning that uh, U.S. persons themselves can hire an attorney and go after these businesses. They don't have to wait for the attorney general necessarily. So, Doug, I'm going to do a full stop there. Any questions that have rolled in um, or comments? None at this point, Scott. Okay. Well, let's go to the next slide then, and uh, we'll go into some more depth. So what's happened since CCPA? Uh, lots of stuff. One is that, for la lack of a better word, there's been just lots of lobbying. So you have folks on one side of the fence, for example, Electronic Frontier Foundation, who want this 
regulation even stronger. You have those on the other side of the fence that want it weaker. That's the Association of National Advertisers Coalition. So lots of lobbying going on to make changes. I don't expect any changes for better or for worse, but there's lots of lobbying nonetheless. There's lots of commentary, including uh, Eric Goldman's blog from Santa Clara University. So if you just Google Eric Goldman and Santa Clara University, you'll get his blog. He gives all kinds of in-depth views to CCPA. There's been lots of corrections because the initial law was drafted so quickly and pushed out the door so, so quickly that a lot of spelling errors, grammatical errors, just lots of just nonsense really got into the bill. A technical corrections bill was signed in the law a couple months ago, but it was just making grammatical changes. There really weren't much in the way of substantive changes, I'm afraid to say. So uh, people were hoping there was going to be some changes there really weren't to speak of. Money, now the AG's office did get about $700,000 in money to help prosecute this and five new staffers. So that certainly will, will help things. I suspect they're going to need a lot more than that, though. So let's go to the next slide and we'll, we'll dig a, even, even deeper into this. So who's protected or what's protected under CCPA? Protects consumers. So natural persons who are California residents, again, this is in distinction to the GPR. So this is for residents. And the formula for who's a resident is actually quite complex. It has to do with tax law here in the U.S. The net net of it is someone's inside California and they're not a tourist. They're pretty much a resident. It also applies to devices, which is unique. I'm not aware of any other non-U.S. laws that apply to devices. But if, if you are aware of any, please send me a note. I'm happy to look into it. So these are internet connected devices, whether that is your, your laptop or your router or what have you, or cell phone, et cetera. Also includes households. So if you're, say, a cable company or power company and you are a, a for-profit entity, then also just, just households as a whole are also counted, which is interesting. Again, I think this is unique. Households are not defined, though, interestingly. So businesses subject to the act. This is really where the rubber meets the road here. So there's three different ways as a business you can be subject. And, and when I say business, I, I mean any for-profit legal entity. You could be a sole proprietor, a partnership, what have you. As long as you're for-profit, you're subject as far as these, these terms are concerned. Doesn't apply to government agencies, doesn't apply to non nonprofits, at least not yet anyway. So for-profit entities. So either you have an annual gross revenues greater than 25 million, which is not terribly high, or if you are buying, receiving, selling, sharing for commercial purposes, personal information of 50,000 or more consumers, households, or devices. So you could have 10,000 consumers, 10,000 households, and 30,000 devices, which is not terribly difficult to do. You think about how many cell phones you could have an app that is, is loaded onto a cell phone. In principle, then you've got a device. So it's not difficult at all to hit that 50,000 unit limit. Or if you derive 50% or more of your annual revenue from selling consumers' personal information, that's very easy to hit because, again, if you have apps and you're selling the personal information that you're drawing from the app, say it's the usage information, potentially then you could easily be subject just based upon that alone. So startups out there that are tech startups, if you're an app developer or you're selling something else that is pulling information from other parties and you're selling that, not difficult at all to be subject to that. And that's probably item C is the one that's most likely going to be applicable to those of us on the webcast here. So let's go to the next slide and then we'll talk about the real fine print here. First of all, there's very little wiggle room in the statute. This applies, and I think this is largely the consensus, this applies globally. And here's why. Under California regulations, uh, and you can see it here, the obligation to businesses it applies to all businesses unless all of your activity takes place wholly outside of California. So if you reverse that, any activity that is taking place inside of California means you're subject to this. So again, this is, an, is a presumption based upon how this is written. It doesn't necessarily say that, but the implication is that unless you, your activities are taking place wholly outside of California, then you are subject to this. And I think that's going to be the safer way to approach this. In terms of, of is this applicable to you, if you have operations that are not in California, say there's in one of the other 49 states, does this apply to you? The answer is yes, because California has what's called a long arm statute. Under American constitutional law, if you do business in a state, even if you don't necessarily have operations there, you don't have people there or a building or what have your equipment, 
you can still be held to account in that state even if you are doing business in another state. So say that I was headquartered in Florida, but I was doing business, directing business or targeting consumers in California. California's long arm statute would apply and I could bring people operating in Florida into California courts. That's our long arm statute and I think that's going to essentially be globally applicable. Again, how do I know that? Well, if you look at section 140C1, we talk about those that are determining the purposes and means of the processing of consumers' personal information. That was basically copied and pasted right out of GDPR. So if you are a data controller, if you have those purposes and means, then it sounds like to me that you're going to be subject to this law. And I think that's going to be largely the consensus as we go down the road on this, on this regulation. So we'll talk about the principal requirements in consumer rights of GDPR, I'm sorry, of CCPA, according to the slip there. The one I put in red here is the big one. This is the right to opt out of the sale of personal information. And that's going to be the big one we'll talk about. The other ones are very GDPR-like, though. So notices of privacy practices, access to personal information, deleting, telling you who's got your information, data portability, uh, applicability to children. All these are things that are also covered in GDPR. And so you're going to find a lot of overlap between the two, which is good news if you're already GDPR compliant. If you're not, then there's a lot of work ahead for you. Let's go to the, the next slide, and we'll talk about the right to opt out, because this is, this is very interesting how this was written. So you really have three angles to the right to opt out. One is you have the right to tell a business, just don't sell my personal information. So that's just flat out. You have the ability to write them a note, however defined, whether it's you literally write them a note or you send them an email or what have you. You have the right to tell them, hey, don't sell my, my personal information. And then you also have the right, or the business has the obligation, if you will, to provide notice to consumers and that the consumer's information may be sold and the consumers have the right to opt out. So not only do you have the right to tell them not to, to sell it, but they have the obligation to tell everyone that they potentially will sell it and you have the uh, right to opt out not to have it sold. And also a third party who already has that information. So say that you sold this information to a third party, they already have it. Now they have to give you the opportunity to opt out as well. So they cannot use it until they give you the opportunity to opt out. So you can see that this is gonna create an absolute blizzard of notices. To folks. And if all of you remember uh, the week of May 25th when GDPR was coming down, how you were getting this blizzard of notices saying opt in, please opt in, continue to opt in, and whatever, which was absurd because that had nothing to do with GDPR. That's really the privacy directive. But yet you were getting this flood of notices. Uh, I know I certainly did. And I had people calling me in panic saying, what do I do? And so forth. So you're going to see the same thing here now. You're going to get a flood of notices saying please don't opt out or, or please opt in or whatever it is, but you're going to be getting these notices now if someone has your personal information as we'll, we'll talk about how it's defined. So other things that you have, you have the, the requirement as a business to publish a notice of privacy practices. You're likely already doing this under GDPR anyway because there was so much information GDPR required. This is now we're uh, asking you to publish the consumer's rights. So rights, about personal information that's being collected, the fact that it could be disclosed or sold, that they cannot discriminate against you for exercising these rights. You also have to publish as a business a means for people to contact you. So that could be a toll-free number, it could be a website address. I suggest it be both, but at the minimum, it should be one or the other. And we'll talk about what other things you have to do. You also have to publish categories of personal information that you collected over the last 12 months. So uh, information that was collected about consumers, I know it says about that consumer, really they mean about consumers in general. Categories from which it was collected, so getting an idea of who the sources are, the categories of the sources, so was it from the cable company, was it from a, a, a telecommunications company, or someone you did business with, the business or purpose for why you were collecting it in the first place, and the kind of third parties to whom you are sharing or with whom you are sharing it. There was also a uh, Scrivener's error in there that required uh, specific pieces of information about a given consumer. Obviously, that was an error. You don't want to be putting specific information on your website about things you're collecting about an individual person. So they, um, they got rid of that. Also, you have to list the categories of personal information that you either sold or disclosed over the last year. So not only do you have to see what you are collecting, but what you're disclosing and give an idea of what the categories are as well. So think about 
whether it's going to be categories of information. So we sell people's names, we sell their addresses, we sell their IP addresses, we sell their MAC addresses. We, I'm, I'm, being, I'm being a little bit absurd here, but most likely it's going to be email addresses. It may be sites that you visit it potentially, even if it's not necessarily tra trackable back to you. So there's a lot of information that's going to be potentially sold that have to be listed here. And there's a lot of questions as to how specific do you have to get, how granular. The Attorney General, I'm sure, will add some light to that and get an idea of what exactly uh, has to be um, accounted for. But you can see that this is going to be a lot of work to determine what information has to be listed here. And so uh, you're going to see a lot of different interpretations of that as we go on, much like we did with GDPR. So right to access to personal information, you may say, hey, this is like a data subject access request. And the answer is, yeah, it's very much like that based on the same idea. It's different in, in its specificity. You, um, you have to offer the categories of personal information, the sources you got it from. It's not just the information, but the sources, why you did it, with whom you are selling it or, or sharing it, and then the actual specific pieces of information that is being collected. So the, your name, your address, your email address, your social security number, your passport, et cetera. So you really have to get into some granularity. So people have the ability to get all of that. So it's in some ways, I think, a little bit broader in application, perhaps in GDPR, where the collection tends to focus on just the personal information that was being collected. Now you're having to go into categories, the actual sources, the reason. Although I guess GDPR really requires you to, to have a, a legitimate reason to process it in the first place, a legal basis to process it in the first place. So it, this is a rough equivalent to what you have to uh, disclose under GDPR as well. So right to delete personal information. Now you may say, okay, this is just like GDPR. Actually, not so much. There's a lot of exceptions to this. I was surprised. And Doug, if you go to the next slide, I'll, I'll start citing a couple. I'm not going to go through all of them. But one in particular, I thought this was kind of interesting, is that if you are reasonably anticipating doing business with the consumer again, you don't have to delete the information. So say that you have their shipping information or you have something else that's personal. If you anticipate doing business with them again, you don't have to delete it, which seems kind of ridiculous, but that's the exception that you have here. There's other exceptions as well, but they're, they're pretty fringe in my view. But this idea that if you're going to do business again, you get to keep it. I don't know. It seems a bit pointless, but that's an exception. Then if you go to the next slide, there's another gaping hole here that I think is going to be taken advantage of, and that is that you can use the personal data internally in a lawful manner that's compatible with the context with the reason you collected it with for in the first place. So that seems to be just an absolute gaping hole that you could use to keep personal data. So someone says, delete my personal data, you say, well, we collected it and we're going to use it for these internal purposes. We won't share it necessarily, but we will use it for internal purposes. So in many ways, there's going to be a lot of personal data that I think is not going to get deleted. It probably should be because of this idea of being compatible with the context for why you provide it in the first place. That seems to be, it could be anything. So I'm a little bit suspicious about that. We'll see what the AG has to say about that. Brand information sold or disclosed. So you have the right to be informed. And again, this is something that we talked, we touched upon earlier. So this is the right to be informed about information that was collected about you. The category is personal information that was sold and the third parties to whom it was sold. And if also you disclosed, you as a business disclosed the information about the consumer for a business purpose, you also, so if you're not selling it, but you're disclosing it otherwise for a business purpose, then you have to disclose that as well. So you really have three different areas here where you have to disclose or inform to people about in personal information and to whom it was sold or to whom it was disclosed and what, what it was, et cetera. So uh, it's, again, more or less akin to what we have in GDPR. I think it goes, in, it's a little more wordy, but essentially I think it's requesting the same information pretty much. Let's go to the next slide, Doug. So right to data portability. This is pretty much standard data portability, just copied right from GDPR. Same kind of principles that apply. Being able to transfer data or give someone their data in a portable format. That could be in a PDF, it could be in a, a .xls, or some other format that's readily usable by other programs. So PDF, a Word format, XLS, comma delimited format perhaps. Things that you can pretty much read with just any copy of Word or Excel or, or an Adobe PDF reader or something like that. I think you're going to find that that's going to be the same more or less. I know that Microsoft and other companies are developing common formats to share 
personal data as well. So keep your eye out for those. But in the interim, if you're asked to put data in a portable format, I think it's fairly safe to say writing, uh, developing a report, running a report on your, your software system, whatever it might be, and PDFing that or creating a, a Word document or creating an Excel file, I think will be, uh, will be adequate for, for what this is requested. All right, Doug, let's go to the next one. And opt-in for children approximately under the age of 16. This is, again, very similar to what we have under GDPR, but it's a little more granular and it's a little more involved. And I know that various EU member states can decide between 13 and 16 what the age of, of consent is and, and uh, who has to consent and all so forth. Here, this is a little different. Here it says that if you're under 16, and the business's actual knowledge that the consumer is under 16, then it must have an opt-in consent from the minor consumer if they're between 13 and 16, okay? If that consumer is under 13, then the parent or guardian must give consent. What happens if you're exactly 13? We don't know. So this was, again, the problem when you uh, publish a law in six days or however many days it was, these things get uh, get missed. So don't have an answer for that, but generally speaking, get consent if someone is under 16. From whomever you get a consent from, that's the safest way to go. This is, we already have laws here in the U.S. that require consent for uh, collecting data of minors anyway, so this isn't terribly new for us. In the EU, again, there's a lot of variability uh, as to an individual state setting whatever the minimum age is for consent. Okay, Doug, we'll go to the next one. Secondary rights. This is something you really don't have in GDPR or in the EU in general, but it's an interesting variation. So let me go through this here. You can't discriminate against a consumer if the consumer exercises their rights. Now, obviously, in the GDPR, you can't discriminate either, but they don't necessarily call it out the same way they do here. So under the secondary rights, you're under no discrimination. You can't charge someone a different price for goods or services or impose penalties on them because they won't give you their personal information. So that's item item B in specifically that I'm referring to here on this list. However, it then contradicts itself and says that nothing prohibits you from charging consumer a different price or rate if the difference is reasonably related to the, to the value to the consumer by the consumer's data. I think they mean value provided to the business by the consumer's data. So item B is saying you can't charge a different price just because someone will give you their personal data. But then on item two, it's saying, yes, actually you can based upon the value that's provided ostensibly by the consumer to the business. So this is, again, a, an issue that's going to have to be resolved. It sounds like that this is just a bug on how this was written. The net net of it for all of you is that if you have a freemium model, say that you publish an app or piece of software for free, people get to use it for free in exchange for using their personal data, or they can buy a professional license, and then there's no processing of personal data, or there's no, you don't see any ads. A lot of times freemiums, You'll, you'll have to watch ads or something like that. And then, of course, the ads, the click-throughs and all the data you get from clicking on the ads or looking at the ads is, is then assimilated by the uh, whoever provided the ad. That's going to then have to be considered whenever you're publishing an app or publishing a piece of software that's based on the freemium model. Because in theory, if uh, you can't discriminate against someone if they don't want to give you your personal data, presumably you could still force them to watch ads for it, but you in theory, couldn't sell the ad data. So the net net of it is that this is going to have to be worked out by the AG's office. And if you're functioning on a, on a freemium model, this is not going to be friendly to you at all. So just be prepared to defend why you are charging one rate versus another based upon the value provided to you by the consumer. Let's go to the next one, Doug. So a couple of other aspects of the act that I think is important. There's the definition of personal information and what is not personal information. Again, there's some, some hazards here. And there's also some exceptions as well that uh, we'll just touch upon. So let's go to the definition of personal information. This is really going to be, I won't say shocking, but this is going to be a big deal for those of you in the EU because we've taken the concept of personal information and expanded it substantially. So right now, personal information are identifiers that you would expect would be personal information. So your name, your postal address, a some kind of unique personal identifier, or an email address, an account name, IP address, things like that, social security number, things like that you would expect to be personal information. Okay, that's easy. We expect that. But then if you go to the next slide, there's also a very duplicative category of personal data that the authors of this statute have put together. And so it's, again, 
a name, a signature, a social security number, physical characteristics, and it goes on and on and on, bank account numbers, uh, employment history. So it's a grab bag of just about any kind of piece of information you can imagine. This was copied and pasted from the state data breach notification law. So you can see why there's going to be some overlap. The authors just grabbed this and just pasted this right here. So this is also considered personal information. But, but wait, there's more. If you go to the next slide, Doug, you'll see you have all of this information's personal information. So, for example, characteristics of protected classifications. What does that mean? That is, when we say protected classifications, we mean protected classes. So, again, this is a bit of a, of a Scribner's error here. Protected classes meaning race, ethnicity, religion, etc. Think of it as a rough equivalent to the special categories of data that you have in our GDPR. This is a rough equivalent to that. You also have commercial information. So all the records of things that you've purchased, maybe that you spend time on eBay or on Amazon or, or Walmart or what have you, that all those records, that's personal information. Your biometric information. So if you're using a thumbprint to scan in uh, in places or what have you, or a fingerprint to scan in, that information is now personal information, which again, not terribly surprising. Also your, in, your internet search history, that's personal information. So again, that was not necessarily called out under GDPR with now cookies were, which contains that information. So again, by I think by implication it was, but here it's called right out. Geolocation data, that is called out under GDPR. Now, if we go to the next slide, this is, it gets really good here. So you have audio, electronic, visual, thermal, olfactory, or similar information. So presumably smells uh, related to you are also now personal data. So congratulations, we've expanded this even further in GDPR. Also, professional or employment related, not terribly surprising there, that's already covered in GDPR. Education information. Now here's what's interesting, you look at the last line here. Inferences drawn from this, any of this information so you can create a profile. Now, that's not called out as personal information under GDPR. There's obviously a restrictions on profiling, but this flat out just says inference is drawn. So that's a big deal because you can make the argument that you can draw all kinds of inferences and actually have an entire presentation just on inferences and what you can draw from them. And it's actually pretty big that I've done for IAPP. And I can tell you that uh, this is going to be a huge expansion of personal data, something that even goes beyond what we have for GDPR. So just a great expansion. This is something that you'll have to take into account when you update or create your data inventory, all this information here. So a lot more work for folks that I don't think they appreciate. Let's go to the next slide, Doug. So what is not personal information? Um, this is not terribly helpful. So it's not publicly available information. Okay, yep, I get that. But then they have this dangling sentence here where it says, uh, for, for these purposes, it's information that's lawfully made available. If any conditions associated with such information, something, okay, probably are such in, conditions are met or what have you, I don't know, but they just kind of just let that dangle. So we're not quite sure where we are with that. Um, and then on the last line here, you see it says publicly available doesn't include information that's de-identified or aggregate consumer information. What I think they mean here is personal information does not include consumer information as de-identified or as aggregate. They're not really referring to publicly available. So again, I think that was an error that it crept into here. And uh, hopefully that will be fixed at some point. The net net of this whole thing is that if it's publicly available information, it's not going to be considered personal information unless, if you look at the third bullet here, the use is, is not compatible for the purpose for which it was collected in the first place. Now, I think that's a pretty low bar because you think about it, if you take publicly available information, the use you're going to do for it is probably something different than it, the government collected for it in the first place anyway, um, just by the nature of what the government does versus what we do commercially. So the bar is pretty low for that. So the idea that you're going to be able to screen scrape publicly available information and use it commercially under CCPA uh, probably is a no-go. And this is one of these things, again, that's very subtle that you wouldn't really think about unless you, uh, you start digging into this. All right, Doug, let's go to the next slide, and let's talk about some exceptions to the Act. I'll talk about two main ones that have caught my attention. One is that this is the idea of data that's de-identified, so item five. Collect, use, sell, et cetera, information that's de-identified or is aggregate uh, in the consumer information. So here's the problem here is that de-identifying information is, is a bit tricky because you can only de-identify so much 
before the data itself isn't terribly useful. And the problem is that if you only de-identify a little, it doesn't take a lot of, of work to re-identify the information. Uh, and certainly, uh, there's been so many studies published that talk about how easy it is to infer someone's identity just from three or four data points, location, date, time, date, location points, et cetera. And so the idea that the exception is that if it's data that's been de-identified, really, it doesn't take much to re-identify it. And as a consequence, I think it's a, potentially a not a good exception to this, but it's one that's been published. The other one is aggregate consumer information. That's a little more sturdy because it's tough to aggregate information and then de-aggregate it and try and find an individual, depending on how much information you put in to begin with. So I think that one is good, but as far as de-identified, that's a little more tenuous. And then item six is, is what I talked about earlier, where we, we talked about if every aspect of the commercial conduct takes place wholly outside California, so essentially, you're not subject to this if you have nothing to do with California. You don't target anyone in there. You don't collect any information from any California residents or any devices or any households. If it's completely outside of that, then you're okay. So that's a pretty tough bar because 20% of the U.S. population is in California. So it's not much of an exception in my view. It's not going to be very helpful to anyone. Other exceptions. So, and these are things that you're not going to likely run into because they're with perhaps exception number seven, if it conflicts with evidentiary privileges. So if you're in, you involve the U.S. litigation and you have to enter data into evidence, it's personal data, you'll have at least a pass as far as this law is concerned. There are other ones that are state or, I'm sorry, federal U.S. regulations that you're probably not going to be subject to unless you are in those businesses. So if you are in your credit referral agency or your medical institution, et cetera. So if you have those, you're already governed by U.S. federal law anyway, so it's, it's a bit of a moot point. We go to the next slide, talk about how to comply, because this is the question I get a lot about what do we do. First thing to start with is get your data inventory going. If you're GDPR compliant, you've already got probably a pretty robust data inventory. What's important here is to look at those definitions of personal data we talked about earlier. and make sure that you're accounting for all those things because it's so much broader than even GDPR, which is admittedly pretty broad. I mean, think about when GDPR came out, it was talking about online identifiers, things that are produced by, by tools, applications, protocols, et cetera, which is a pretty expansive view on this. This goes even beyond that with CCPA. It's pretty expansive. I mean, you're looking for olfactory information, for example. I'm being a little bit ridiculous here, but I mean, you're looking for all kinds of things that you just didn't have earlier. Protected classes, so that's something to think about here. Again, this is not unlike special personal data under GDPR. So the net net of it is that just about anything, including inferences, are now personal data, which means it's important to go back review your applications, review all the things that you do with personal data, and make sure that you are able to identify not just all the personal data, but why you're processing it, with whom you're sharing it, okay? Whether it's for a business purpose or whether you're actually licensing it to them. Uh, because if you're licensing it to them, then you have to make sure that that third party knows that they've got to give the ability to opt out and you have to give the ability to opt out. So you've got two different places where you've got to give opt outs to consumers. Again, this is going to create utter chaos, but this is the direction in which we're heading. Next, address consumer information access requests. So very similar. Oh, let's go back one, Doug. We'll come back to the inventory. So address consumer information access requests. So very similar to GPR. You're going to have to authenticate the request, which the question comes up, okay, Scott, what, what can I do to authenticate? Do I need someone's you know, ID, a copy of their ID, and say utility bill. I think that's probably going to be the model that we're going to use since it's, it looks like the model for GDPR. So I suspect that's what we're going to do as well. Collect and package the personal information, just like GDPR. So go through, just grab everything that you can grab. You may have to run a report if, say, you have a structured database like an Oracle database. Just run a report. If it's something that can be dumped to an Excel file, something that can be dumped to Microsoft Word, just dump to that and respond within 45 days. Um, as a practical matter, I would not wait 45 days. I would do it in the most expeditious manner possible because that person may not be happy. They may say, you didn't get it all. They may want to engage with you. So I would not wait 45 days. And certainly that's true under GDPR. I wouldn't wait 30 days that you have. If you think you cannot 
fulfill the request in a timely manner, I would send them a note early. I wouldn't wait to the 45 days. It's just, uh, otherwise, they're just going to go to the Attorney General's office and complain. And then create an opt-out, opt-in mechanism. You've already done this for marketing data because of the granularity of having to give people the opportunity to opt out for marketing. And so um, the same is true here. Give people the opportunity to opt in or opt out, as the case may be, because they're going to want to do so and they have to have the opportunity to do so. So you might as well just get that set up now. That may be particularly laborious. So this is why you've got another year to get this going. I recommend that you use that time to do so. Let's go to the next slide, Doug, and we'll talk about data inventory. This is a data inventory. It's based on an actual one I developed when I was at Robert Half Legal, and I'm very grateful that they're letting me to to use this. Again, I've changed the names of the um, the individuals here to protect them, but otherwise the, the data here is exactly as I developed it. And so if you look at the column that's surrounded in red, you can see that, say that you have an MDM tool. It's mobile data management. What kind of information are you collecting? Well, you're collecting the IMSI number, the IMA number, uh, device ID, and electronic serial number. So that's information that's personal data you have to be accounted for. And again, this is for employees, but this could be for anyone. If you are in the telecom business, then you're collecting this data for your customers. And then there is a um, something I'm calling DLP Master. It's basically a DLP program. So what are you collecting from that? Well, you're collecting the equipment identifiers, processor IDs, user IDs, AD credentials. AD credentials are personal data because they can identify someone. As a consequence, this is a good example of personal data that has to be accounted for. And this, what you're seeing here on the screen is a tiny piece of a much larger data inventory. And so because of CCPA, the scope of this is going to have to be expanded. You're going to have to be looking for a lot more personal data. And you're going to have to also have links in there to uh, who you're, to whom you're licensing it. Because presumably you'll have a contract and you'll have to go review the terms of the contract. And that's subject for another webcast, but that's one thing you'll have to do. Let's go to the next slide. So more how to comply. Address verification for, for children. This is going to be a bit of a challenge because under U.S. law, you didn't necessarily have to address the verification of children in a, with a lot of specificity. If you were just simply directing your your website, for example, to children, then that was enough to put you under the uh, the laws of COPPA. Under GDPR and presumably under CCPA, you don't even have to address children. So that's something that's going to have to be accounted for. If children have access to it or if you're collecting the the personal data of children, it's going to be in scope. So it's not just a matter of just directing information to children or directing commerce to children. It's just if you happen to be collecting it. So keep that in mind as well is that it's easy to get caught in that. Update your privacy statement. So your privacy statement, you've already updated it for GDPR. You're going to have to add all those additional items for CCPA in order to comply with that. You'll also have to add a do not sell my personal information link. So something that is at the bottom of the page, someone can click on it and go, well, don't sell my personal information. So again, giving them the ability to opt out. Review your incident response and breach notification uh, policies and procedures. This is crucial because of the challenge of if you do have a breach, then there's also potentially a private right of action that someone can bring against you. It's not just the AG's office now. It's going to be all the affected parties and all of their attorneys. And that can be extraordinarily expensive. Even if you don't went out paying a lot of money to the victims, you're still going to pay a dump truck a load of money to their attorneys. At least that's how class actions work here in the U.S. So keep that in mind as well. You really want to have a very sharp incident response. Obviously, you already have that through GDPR, 72-hour turnaround. That's going to be the case for CCPA is you also want to have that same discipline with your breach notification incident response. Address your data portability. That's important because, again, for the same reasons it's important for GDPR, people are going to want a copy of their data, and you're going to start seeing other U.S. states are going to be having these same regulations. So, again, now is a very good time to, to address those. Let's go to the next slide, Doug, and some closing thoughts here. I, before I joined Stern, I spent about two-ish years working on GDPR implementations. And the one thing I found is that if someone says to me, a prospect or customer says, oh, IT's got this, I know that they're in trouble. Because this is not an IT problem, it's an everybody problem. It's going to be legal, it's going to be compliance, HR, your lines of business, marketing, all these folks are going to have to be involved. It's not going to be simply an IT problem. So if IT gets stuck with this, and it's often they do, 
I think that it's doing them a disservice and it's doing you a disservice. If you're not part of IT, you want to be involved in this as well. Get your data protection steering committee and get a project champion. You're going to have to really put together a steering committee because you're going to, have to make changes to policies and you're going to need, uh, I'm sorry, need a champion, someone who's higher up in the management structure so that they can push these changes through because this is going to be changing your privacy policy, if you will, which is really um, your, how you address privacy internally and of your customers. You're going to have to address your data classification standards, your data portability standards. I mean, all kinds of standards are going to have to be addressed. What kind of controls you put in place, everything, that's going to have to be addressed. And you need a data protection steering committee. If you have, presumably, you're involved in multinational operations or you probably wouldn't be on this call, then you're going to have to have a multinational team because if you don't, people are going to feel left out and they're not going to support your, your changes. Get on your critical path. Third parties are going to be the most important element here. Third parties are going to kick and scream and say, I don't want to obey this law. I don't want to give an opt out, et cetera. So you're going to have to find all the third parties with whom you work, including cloud providers, because even those folks are technically speaking, people that have personal data of yours for compensation, even though you're only storing it with them, they still have it. So you're going to have to address all your third parties and then how they're going to respond to opt-out requests, et cetera. And that negotiation alone could take six months. I've had six-month negotiations with third parties in just the data protection directive of the EU, not even GDPR, just regular data protection directive uh, fights I had that lasted six months. So this is going to be uh, much more of an issue. Create or update your data inventory. I would recommend having your first iteration by the beginning of the year. And I know that if you're just starting now on this, you're not going to get it done by then, but at least get your project spun up because you're going to have to take a fresh look at all your personal data, all the applications. Remember that a lot of applications are chained together, meaning that you have an HR tool, for example, that is hooked up to a travel management package, for example, or travel management system, an expense management system, a learning management system. All that stuff has to be accounted for as well. Sometimes you'll have audit programs that will audit your expense reports. Okay, that's personal data. So now you've got to go bring that into scope. So the net net of it is you're going to have to really dig into your data inventory and update it appropriately. I would put together some pilot projects and test with selected customers, presumably ones with a lot of patients, because the whole mechanism of opting out and getting third parties to go along with the opt out, it's going to be a lot of work. So I would do a pilot project get a selected customers together that uh, have a lot of patience with you and work with them to perfect this. Don't just turn the switch on July or January 1st, 2020 and say, come on, come all, because it's going to be a train wreck. I left some time. Oh, we have a few more things. Before I finish my summary here, any questions have come through that uh, people want answered? No questions at the moment. I want to remind okay. the attendees, enter your questions in the questions tab, the console. Okay. In that case, let me wrap up here with my summary and uh, we'll um, call it an hour. This is likely the most demanding U.S. state privacy statute. That being said, more are on the way, uh, without a doubt. We've already had about a dozen that have passed this year. In fact, I'm doing another webinar today about that very subject that uh, will be uh, recorded. You guys can come back later and, and uh, listen to it if you like. The net net of it is that U.S. state regulations are really taking the lead here and that you're going to find that rather than a U.S. federal regulation, you're going to have 50 different state regulations you're going to have to adhere to. So that's not an ideal situation, but that's where we are with this. Um, CCPA is not unlike GDPR. In some ways, it's a bad copy of GDPR, a much more complicated version of it. But nonetheless, it is not unlike it. So a lot of the things you've already done over the past two years to comply with GDPR are going to be applicable here, which is, which is good news. Guidance is going to be needed in several areas. There's no doubt the AG's office, who, by the way, is not happy about this regulation. The AG does not want to enforce this. They don't want to spend the, the money and the resources, and they don't want to be in the quote unquote advisory business, but that's what they've been elected to do. So that's what's going to happen here, is that uh, there's going to have to be guidance in, in several areas, uh, specifically what kind of procedures are going to be necessary for to effectuate an opt-out, and uh, how do you notify your, your customers, et cetera. There's gonna be a lot of areas that, that are just gonna need guidance. Penalties are likely gonna be severe. You can have up to $7,500 per record, presumably. 
if there is an intentional violation, even unintentional violations are $2,500 per record. So you think, figure a thousand records, that's two and a half million dollars. And most databases hold millions of records. So it's potentially going to be astronomical. And it's something that really has kind of flown under the radar because we don't couch it in terms of 4% of your annual gross revenue. As I mentioned earlier, this is likely the first wave of a new generation of state privacy statutes. More are on the way. You can expect them for financial institutions, for example, insurers, credit referral agencies. You can expect those coming up uh, in the next 12 months here in the U.S. Most states are going to have those kind of laws. Get started now with your data inventory. I mentioned that earlier. Never too early to start or to at least update it. And don't assume the California legislature is going to come to the rescue. Some people have, I think, engaged in wishful thinking that the California legislature is going to come and fix this whole thing. And I just don't see it happening because if they pull the teeth out of this law, then the folks that developed the ballot initiative originally that this, this whole start this whole process are just going to come back in two years and just do it again. And this time it'll be set in stone. Just for the benefit of folks that are not from the U.S., in many U.S. states, you can do what's called a ballot initiative, which means that you get enough signatures to put uh, a law on the ballot and people vote on it directly. You bypass the legislature. California's Proposition 13 is probably the, the best known one in the U.S. history, but there's all kinds of ballot initiatives. And this started as a ballot initiative, and the uh, initiative team allowed California legislature to pass a law instead of uh, having to suffer through a ballot initiative. So um, that was good of them, but again, these guys could come back. That's all I have, Doug. I know we've got a couple more minutes left. If we have questions, I'll be happy to take them. If we don't, then people can feel free to email me. My contact information is on the last slide, or second to last slide, I guess. And you can feel free to, um, to email me and ask me comments or, or, or questions or offer comments. Otherwise, very thankful for having you all um, on, the, uh, on the webcast today. And, and Doug, thank you for having me on. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Scott. A copy of the PowerPoint presentation and a link to the recording will be emailed in the next couple of days. And we hope to see you at our next webinar. Thanks again, Scott. You're welcome. Have a good day. Bye.